Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Mark introduces you to some of the world's leading creative talent from publishing, film, music, restaurants, medical research, and more. You'll discover how to tap into your most original thinking, how to organize your ideas, and most of all, how to make the connections and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity. Hi everyone, it's Mark Stenson. Our podcast is supported by Design Hill. Design Hill is the world's number one creative marketplace that caters to the creative needs of businesses and individuals alike. You can source high quality designs from professional designers and unique products created by independent artists. Listen later in the episode for a special offer and a discount code. And we're just so happy today to have as our guest, Jake Brown, music biographer, award-winning author. He's created 50 books. I think it's 51 now, but who's 54, counting? 54, because every time I look, there's a new book, Jake. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is that some of the, you wouldn't call them iterations, I guess, in publishing lingo, but I've had the privilege of working for, I mean, at this point, it's probably upward of 20 publishers around the world between the ones that I've written for in the States and then overseas. And one thing that I decided early on to do, and I would recommend this to authors too, if anyone is listening who, who's got a book they want to put out, sometimes because of it's a U.S. Uh, language market, so like Australia, Canada, United Kingdom, North America, and, and beyond, you can go to a Canadian publisher, as an example, Heart in the Studio, which I wrote with Anna Nancy Wilson years ago. Tori Amos in the studio, Rick Rubin in the studio. That's all by a Canadian publisher, ECW. Well, that Rick Rubin book, every year I get a carp royalty <laughs> check. It's not a ton of money, but it's enough. And then just this last, it's really weird during COVID because everyone was home and content demand went up. So I started getting approached by publishers from other countries that I hadn't either published in or had been many years wanting to update these books. So Rick Rubin only ran through 2009. I'm now presently writing a 12 year update to 2021 for that book for a German publisher. I'd never. Mm -hmm. And then of course the logic would be that ECW is going to take it and add that to their paperback so that it's, so that's an example of a book that it, I'm fortunate because when you pick targets to work with or write about, you have to keep in mind, like whether you want to, or it doesn't sound romanticized or anything, but the commerciality of the market of it has got to be there because the publisher's only going to want it if they know there's a base to sell it to that you don't have to create from scratch. So anyway, yes. Rick Rubin is unique because he's a record producer, but I have the only book on him. So I've been fortunate too, because I've gotten lucky. So that was, so that was one example, but like in, in, in then, so I targeted Canada for them, but I've also got three or four publishers in England. The Let Me Kill Master book came out through John Blake. The uh, ACDC and Iron Maiden in the studio came out through John Blake. Cherry Red did Tom Waits in the studio. There's others. So when you get to, and, and then, you, you know, with subrights. So what happens is I think it's 50, but then I get an update from some publisher mm -hmm. that, hey, the, the, you know, and it's cool because these are kids who are now growing up, who are discovering these catalogs through streaming and are then getting the opportunity, not because of me at all. I'm saying the opportunity to have a chronological deconstruction, I suppose, of how all those records are made. And if they have an interest in going into sound engineering, like I was really blown away by this. I did the, the 50th book last summer. We did a, a huge Zoom media thing. It was all kinds of different things. I'd never heard of Zoom, never used it. But then, of course, it changed my life and so many people's. But what's happened is when I talk to people on Zoom who are like, oh, yeah, I had recorded in this studio and we were trying. And the one story that I got directly was from Chris Stapleton's producer, Dave Cobb, who, of course, has reinvented all country here in Nashville. When I approached him in 2018, I started contacting. I had done Behind the Boards one and two years earlier, which is rock producers. And I sort of thought, wouldn't it be interesting to finally get this third one done with a the Nashville producers, because I had just been procrastinating on it, because I, I write three or four books a year traditionally, and it gets exhausting, and you can't let it, but then you get a good idea, and you have to work on it through the contact side, which is totally separate from writing, but I got in touch with Dave Cobb, and they said yes really quick, and when I talked to him and found out why, it's because in his studio at RCA B, where we all put together, and I was a small fish in a very big pond of much bigger people that were all residents on Music Row, tenants, in 2015, when they were first going to tear down RCA to build one of these damn condos, Ben Folds had the space and put a million dollars into it before that. So he was like, look, this is my studio. Then Dave Cobb took it over. But because they've continued to make hit records out of there, so many hit records, Grammy winning albums of every genre, they haven't been able to touch it. It's now got preservation status and everything. But on his shelf is a reference guide for drum sounds as Rick Rubin. And no matter where you go around Nashville, and partly this is because I sacrifice the promos to make sure they are in the studio lounges of a lot of these places. 
but you can find these books and, and anybody could have done these interviews. I was lucky that I, I got to do them mostly for the first time with a lot of these people in a, an actual anthology setting or behind the boards, Nashville. You get the story of the country producer, how they were, when they were a baby, what kind of music they were hearing in their mother's womb all the way through, literally through what they grew up on, what their trials and tribulations getting to town, how they started out a session player and wound up having more of an acumen for producing and learned from the best by playing for them. And then, and, and, you know, these guys were also the writers, but it also showed me to come to Nashville is different than to go to LA or to go to New York. And there was a story in and of itself, but each of these chapters in this book, and there's 30 four of them in this Behind the Boards Nashville. It's also been turned into a two uh, volume audiobook. Which yeah, black yeah. I, and I definitely wanted to talk about that. And you're describing, and this is, you know, and for listeners, look, Jake Brown is written from ACDC at heart, uh, Tori Amos, you mentioned Tom Waits, to rappers like Tupac and R&B like Prince. You know, all of these, but you're describing some common thread, a little bit anyway, of a creative process that metamorphosizes from the idea, you know, or their style into the work. What, it, what have you learned about from writing about all these people? Oh my God. Yeah. You know, what haven't I learned? I've learned what I can't do. And I mean, I'm an, I'm an instrumentalist of seven instruments by ear since I was five. I mean, I, I grew up a musician, started out working for record labels in Los Angeles and just by happenstance got into to book writing. But I wanted to do it if I had to do it because I've always been a music writing kid. You know what I mean? I'm, on, I'm not trained. It's all by ear. But it was like, if you're going to do this, you need to take it on from the standpoint of like my In the Studio series to answer your question which is trademarked now proudly in, in 15 years and counting. I had dumb luck. No one had that in the studio. I was like, is this crazy? And no one. Had. And so I immediately started the, the process of writing that Tupac uh, Shakur in the studio book with his estate with Afini Shakur. And what I learned through that, because that was the first in the studio book, was there are many more of these. And this template can be applied to almost any band across any genre. And if you find a way as an author to do that, be if you're a history author or a, I mean, it could be anything, romance or paranormal whatever fantasy tr crime thriller mystery if you find a niche as an author jump into it hit fast forward on the gas and publish as much as you can and i don't mean publish yourself there's a difference i'm sorry to just be factual about it you're either published by a real publisher or you're not now that doesn't mean that when you're starting out you can't go to some of these great forums through which fan fiction is an example where you like an author and you can write an original variation of their story and then a publisher might see that there's all sorts of contests and there's all kinds of online things critique peer groups there's lots of ways for you to start but if you're really going to get published and then keep getting published you have to first find a publisher they have to like your idea they have to be able to put the money into it market it sell it make a profit from it come back to you and say we want to do another one when you get another one you have to go okay well who am i going to write about now well i had the fortune because i also took anything that was thrown at me when i was first working so i did jasmine st Clair, who's an adult film star from the 90s from who doesn't quite remember or want to admit remembering her through her so I was friends with a lot of these guys i got to interview like lenny lemmy kilmeister and i, I thought man idea would be to do a motorhead in the studio book and i cold called him on the side of a highway when my car broke down in going to chicago and i said i had to wait on a like a tow truck and i thought i'm gonna just call him and i called him and i said hey let me this is you know we met through this and i write this other series and could i send you a copy of the book he said yeah i fedex made out the fedex form in the car and dropped it off at the stop and then on the way back i got him back on the phone and i said hey did you get the book this and that and he said yeah let's do it well, that was another, I mean, I, I'm one of three, I'm the privilege of being one of three authors that's gotten to write books with Lemmy. And that book was wild because we were literally like, we came up with the cover together. He texts, he's like, text me, I got it. You know, 1130 at night, oh, war pig with the headphones and the sunglasses on. And then I, his people gave me exclusive use of the war pig and our designer put together the cover with the, I mean, it was really interactive. But what I learned from that too was, you know, that book got published by John Blake and that exposed me to a British reading audience really early in my career. So, I mean, really early is to say seven or eight years in, but my, so, but the first books I wrote were rap books. Should Knight, which is still a mm -hmm. lure, a book of, it is inextricably tied me to that West Coast story because there's no one else has done a book on Should Knight. And I got lucky in that fact. Now I'm writing with Corrupt, who's another West Coast dog pound, you know, and, and to hear from him. And, and when they did the Death Row Chronicles 18 years later, I was the biographer of record and there for the first time is me and Shug juxtaposed against each other in back and forth and he's secretly being interviewed from LA County Jail. So if you pick really cool projects that you think are cool 
and you can convince someone else that they're cool publish then they're attracted into it then they yeah because then because then it connects you with the reading audience of the actual listeners of these people so you're not even going to like bs fans you're going to you're going to the real source and that's important in distinction because a lot of times authors don't think like that when they're starting out they just think oh i'm going to find a publisher and they're going to find the audience and then we'll together you know, they'll want to read more of my books. It does not work. And especially 20 years later in today's world, I'm 45 and I'm just as, I mean, the social media pages that I maintain for different book projects, I can't stand doing it personally, but like on Twitter, you'll see mine go dormant for four months. So there's a new one, but on like the YouTube channel for the upcoming show, I'll tell you about that. The streaming television show I've been filming all, all year. We post every week, two or three new clips from these many, many interviews. So you can just but so you have got to, but think you about, still got to fuel the fire. You have to think about the marketing. Yeah. yeah. If you find yeah. a fan base or people that are willing to, that are fans of a band, well, they, you know, they can read an, anyone can write an unauthorized biography. I've written them. I, I, early well, early. I was going to ask you, Jake, the difference between these sort of authorized collaborative, I'm working with the uh, versus, Hey, I want to write about this person because I think either I like them or I'm going to expose something, whichever it is. But I've never done one of those. And I've turned down a lot of them. I did a book in 2000, 2003. It was my second published book. It was on R. Kelly. I did it because I needed the money and because the publisher that put Shook Knight came back to me and they said, we want a book on R. Kelly. Do you want to write it? And I said, well, I think R. Kelly is a child molester and a scumbag. And I said that then. And in fact, my book, which then Doubleday picked up in their book club thing, which was a big deal for a second book out author, demanded that I write a new introduction that watered down at the time, his whole thing. And I was like, you know, I just don't feel comfortable with this, but they sold me. They said, this guy's beloved in the African-American community. He, the women that the situation there, it's different. You have to understand that you got to write around it. You know, we need to sell this. And so when it came out, I just stayed yards away from it. But for many years after that, I would get approached by, because see, if you're, if you're lucky too, if you're an author and your books are selling and they see you can write these kind of books, and I'm no, this is not just me, this is a, a, an industry-wide thing. Publishers are often looking for authors that are young and new, but that can do this to write this trash stuff like you're talking about, no one else wants to. So it's not that I dissuade people from doing it, but I really urge them, kids that grew up luckily reading, my, you know, my stuff that write me, ask me about it. I see, you know, pick the stuff really carefully that because it might be like a lady gaga book i did a lady gaga book i didn't know anything about her at the time and it was a payday and it was like 10 years ago and i needed the money so i took it and i wrote a really i wrote as much as i could without any sensationalism and that's hard to do with someone like her because she invites that as part of her image now that's different now with the oscar and everything yes yes but to answer that question but you know you're also describing though i mean across all these genres this is not because you just like this genre or that you just like this artist you're writing a music biography well what changes yeah what changed about it was very early on the way i wrote them and i don't take i you know i don't know i i'm very I'm, I'm very reticent to take credit for anything because everything had been done already. But one thing that I have been proud of in my catalog, and I think it's one of the reasons I've kept working at a place where I was able to work with bigger groups that led me to like Joe Satriani or led me to Hart or led me to lend me some of these later acts is that everything's on the record. There's no, I've never once in any book I've ever done had an unauthorized source. And I think it's almost toxic now to have that in your books because there's such an internet base for that you know it it almost it it almost groups you in like a national Enquirer type of author but what what was important with the in the studio series which was a breakthrough after four years of writing these hip-hop books and i love tony rose and amber books he gave me my start and i thank him every day for it but the in the studio books was a huge breakthrough because what it did is it, it validated me to go out and talk directly to the engineers who nobody was talking to a, a, a crap about Tom Waits' 1970s asylum catalog. And that's a shame because it's the best part of his catalog. It's the part that started everything. It, it, it revolutionized a genre of music. It didn't exist before him. And Bones Howe is the man who made that happen. And I tracked down Bones Howe and left him a voicemail. Because back then, and, and, and this is the other thing, you have to be as a, as a biographer, you have to be a researcher, uh, like a skip tracer almost, because 
back then, who is .com, when someone registered a .com address, they had to put a host. It was before GoDaddy did it all and anonymized. So you could, I mean, so the first book series that I actually started that was studio focused was called Behind the Boards in 2003. And I was talking to these guys that I grew up listening to. And I was, and I know every note of their catalog by almost any instrument that was on it, not to their level of performing, but because I play a lot of them. So I could ask them questions and I'd been in studios for a few years already. So they were like, okay, so you actually want to know about like, how many feet away the mic, and this is not, like I said, this is not something that hadn't been done, but in books, it really hadn't been done till in the studio where where the microcosms of every sound were, were analyzed. You're really and, breaking it down. Yeah, you could yeah. find out like, dude, how did you get Bob Rock? I wanted to know how he got that Canon, you know, type drum sound for Kickstart and, and Feel Good and all those songs. And he was like, well, I was recording at a place called Little Mountain and Bob Clear Mountain, who's one of the most legendary mastering engineers in the world, owned that studio. So he built out a big, like huge back bay where the buses loaded equipment in. And then normally you went into this other room to record. They just stayed out there. Well, that's fascinating. And then to hear them, they do all the really the work of, uh, of filling in the, well, I set it to 5 dB below this and I did that. But another thing that it really helped me appreciate was the difference between producing from the standpoint of someone and there are many of them, and I've interviewed most of them, and I respect them immensely who kind of, kind of don't really know how to work the board. And then those engineers who then went on to become producers who started out really doing the recording. And I could point you to Mike Klink or really dear for a lot of years, friend, someone I knew well, Mike Frazier, who produces ACDC now. When I knew him, he was sort of still engineering them, but then they gave him his first producer when I started interviewing him across many books. But these guys really were the ones doing the, you know, the setup. And and, and I was like, well, tell me about that because you engineered that record, really you co produced it, you taking the credit for it and be like, let's talk about it. So what I really tried to do is to go into every corner of the recording studio so that if you were reading it, you could listen to it, you could read along and there's narrative intro and pro stuff, but it really you get the, you get the producers, you get the engineers, and then it expanded into let's just try to get the, the band. And when Hart came along, I actually did that book in reverse. I went and I interviewed everybody else first. So I had all of my, I was basically going to them saying, I'm putting this out either way, but I'd like to have you included. And Howard Lease gave me Ann Wilson's email. And I, and I knew that that was a really tricky thing. This is 2007. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to email her. And I'll just say, hey, I've got all these, other, everyone else that's ever worked with you has already talked to me. And all the producers, all the band members, everybody. I would love to be able to get you and Ann, you and Nancy to properly connotate this book and give it context and give me your, and I was shocked the next day when their manager called and rather than telling me they were going to sue me or anything <laughs> else. So you take chances when you're, when you're building a, a writing career, especially in the music business, because it's the toughest business to, to, to get one thing and let alone a bunch. And so anyway, they gave me interviews and I was floored by it. And then it took me another year. I sold it the day before my grandfather died to ECW press. And I had to, well, I, I sold it a couple of months, but I finished it the day before. I had to finish it, hand it in, and then drive overnight to see him in the hospital. And I got to tell him, and it was really cool. That book was life-changing for me. I mean, that was a career-changing book, but, but it also opened so many doors that you only get to walk through once. Mm -hmm. And then in other words, so if you walk through it and you do it half ass or you have the wrong client, which I've got a folder called probably won't happen projects, and I won't name any of them because I could be sued. <laughs> but if you half the guys you've heard in Classic Rock Radio, I have done sort of these preliminary, maybe let's do a couple sample interviews and see where it goes. We'll be right back with our interview here on Unlocking Your World of Creativity. But first, a reminder of the discount that I promised you at the beginning of the show from Design Hill. You can get an exclusive 25% off of Design Hill's Logo Maker service. Just use the code WF25. The link is in the show notes. And remember, the offer is valid through November 30th, 2021. And now back to our interview. And I, I think to talk about their craftsmanship is great. I want to talk about yours for a little bit too. Yeah, sure. And that is this audio book on behind the boards that's called Thank like God. a synchronized experience. You've got the interview, you've got the sample, you got the sound, it's the audio. I mean, the whole thing is yeah. sort of a connected creative experience, isn't it? it? It it'd be it it can be. Yeah. I didn't start writing audio uh, reading audio books until Blackstone approached me and asked me if I would do it and read them myself versus going and assigning them out to somebody else. And the first two we did, one's called Doctors of Rhythm, which is a hip hop anthology. And I took all the producers in there and they're every, everyone's in there. 
Johnny J, Tupac's producer from all the Death Row stuff, to Teddy Riley, to Easy Mo B, to got Pete Rock, Eric B, Legends, Kanye West's guy, Mike Dean, of course, Boy Wanda from Drake. So it covers also Eminem. That was an interesting learning experience because I read my narrative parts and then we archive from the original interviews directly from the voices of the producers. You then would hear them talk instead of me read. That proved to be extremely arduous to produce because I'm a, already, I have a catalog of 250 songs as a songwriter and I'm, I make records under a lot of names on the, the Spotify that are all me playing and singing or performing everything, but they have the, like the Nashville Suns. But so I knew my way around a studio well enough to know what the hell this was going to be. And it was, we got it done. Then we did one with the drummers for Beyond the Beats, which came out in 2018. And that got a really cool reception as far as USA Today did a nice cover story on it. Tommy Lee did a really nice blast on his social media. I've known him for years through other books. And some of the other other, I met these drummers doing Kenny Arnoff's memoir. And I just said, hey, man, got this idea. Would you guys be interested? See, that's the other thing. When you're writing to talk about process, you have got to seize the moment while you're talking to these people. Billy Corgan, I interviewed for that book. I was writing for Tape Op at the time, which is a recording magazine, sort of cult recording magazine. And I was just taking old behind the boards interviews and giving them to them and repackaging it. But I said to them, hey, I have an opportunity here. But this is before the arena reunions. He, you got to catch these guys from there. I said, you know, I'm kind of getting along pretty good with Billy Corgan. And we're talking about it in the studio book, but I don't think it's going to happen because he's doing his own book. But he is willing to give me a really extensive interview and in the studio book, essentially in Tape Op magazine. Mm-hmm. Well, that that gave me access to Jimmy Chamberlain. There goes another. So when you get these interviews with people like meeting Lemmy through Jasmine, you, it's also networking to talk about process. It really is. You have to go, OK, I have this other idea. Is there a chance you'd consider talking to me? And, and when they say yes, then you have to be really well researched. And that's another thing that rock and roll kind of, you know, vibe books and everything seem like, yeah, man, I wrote it. You know, even songwriters that that 20 seconds, their 30 seconds that they get the riff idea that then becomes a song, there's another hundred that never, you know, mm-hmm. but it's different with books. You can't have a hundred book ideas because they're not a minute long, they're 200 pages long. So anyway, and sometimes the research to even get ready to write them can be that and then you don't. So I tried throughout my catalog building up to where I'm going with the audiobooks, after Heart, after Motorhead, I had this incredible opportunity and that came through sitting up till three in the morning, emailing directly, or through the manager's artists saying, hey, I have this idea in the studio book. I think your catalog would be great. I don't just do mass blanket, but mm-hmm. I reach out to Joe Satriani, who I, everyone you know knows of our generation is the best selling instrumental guitar player of all time. And incredibly, other than even Halen and Steve Bai, who, who he was, of course, his instructor. Joe was an instructor to Kurt Hammond. I thought this book could be like an in the studio book. And the next morning, I got a call from or an email from Mick uh, Brigden, his manager, saying, Joe wants to talk to you at 11 o'clock today. You have three minutes when he gets on the phone to give him an elevator speech for this book. And sure enough, when I got on the phone with him, he said, tell me exactly what this book is, what you envision with this book being about, how you figure we'd write it. And, it, and you know, and in three minutes later, we were, we were rocking and rolling. He said, mm-hmm. he said, I said, I just don't think your genius is a guitar player has ever been analyzed or properly documented in, in a book. And I want to do that with you because I think it will help generations of people in the future when they're figuring out how the hell you played all this stuff here right from the horse's mouth and and so why I emphasize that is that was a career changing book for me even above heart because that you know when you're a biographer or you're any kind of a book author you're competing with an average of 2,000 you know books a year that are released and maybe more than that now because of all the ebooks back then Mm -hmm. it was about and within the music genre, there was when that paperback mass market era was kind of around in the early millennium, there was some real trash. And so you really had to, to get to a Satriani level place. Then you get that gig. Well, now you have the responsibility. It's like being a producer and getting the gig with Metallica. Well, now you got to go in there and produce it, as Bob Rock explained to me. And so I thought, man, what is the list I'm going to have together here? And we sat there and just put together, you know, I got to interview Glenn Johns out of that book and, and, I'd already talked to Eddie Kramer and pretty much everybody else, but just to talk to Glenn Johns, I didn't get to ask him about any other records, which sucked. Because normally I can turn an interview, like yeah. the Corgan thing, Flood was one of those producers. And I was like, could I ask you just about a few other records? I mean, As you're bringing up something important, I think, to say, look, I've, I've done the preparation, I've done the research, but ultimately, as other guests have told me, there is the three minute pitch. You know, here, I mean, literally, what do you got? Give it to me or I'm hanging up. Well, and here's the other thing, that three minute pitch is a sort of, uh, that's going to be what you're promoting a lot of the time too. And and this was the other thing with writing with Joe that was so important. We talk about a process. We had a standing appointment every Friday. I had a digital recorder. 
I had my old fashioned, you could kill someone if you hit them over the head with it. Dad gave me big, heavy tape recorder from the 70s, and I had a third one. And I made three copies of every one of those interviews because I was so paranoid about losing them. And through those interviews, I really, really only got to understand, and I spent two years in a really comprehensive box with Joe Satriani on, and then we again teamed up in 2017 to expand his paperback, another two albums. So I've, I've known this gentleman for, for over almost a decade now, which is to say professionally, I'm not, we're not personally, I haven't been to his house for dinner, but he, he was the nicest I mean, he was not as accessible to me personally as other artists. And even if I was talking to him for two hours, because he's such a scientist, when you're talking to him, he's getting into the explaining to you how he did the riff for, you know, Surfing with the Alien or Summer Song. And you're just sitting there like, this is just incredible to get to listen to. Well, how the heck am I going to take this? And so that book evolved from an in the studio book to then when I sold it to Ben Bella books and I agented, I've agented 38 of my 50 books myself. You get to know these editors that buy these properties and you meet them at BEAs and you send them new stuff. And so there's a lot of networking behind the scenes to being a successful author that's beyond the writing. But what I did do with Joe is I kept encouraging him very quietly and I can't take total credit for this, but the project evolved beyond in the studio book. It turned into what, what and I'm proud that I, he came up with the Strange Beautiful Music. I came up with a musical because I, the publisher really, to their credit, Glenn Yefeth put us in a position where he said, guys, we could have a like a 10,000 run hardcover type yes. of book. The average music. Yeah, you, you, I did a book with a country rapper named Big Smo a couple of years ago. And if you are from these parts, he's a pioneer in that genre. We were lucky. We got Barnes and Noble and you go in there and there's a couple of copies. But when I'm Satriani, you walked in right on those front tables. I mean, they yeah, really were. Yeah. But they expected from us to really deliver the goods. So there was a nuanced process of getting Joe to where he was comfortable talking about some of his personal background while respecting. He's a very private guy. And I tried very hard to respect that because it was he was just the nicest guy I think I've ever written with. I mean, I just, I can't say enough nice, nice things about him. And when the book came out, I'm used to, my name's always on it. It's by so-and-so with me. You have to contractually make sure you get that done as a piece of advice. Cause I've had one publisher screw me on it and I never wrote for them again. I almost sued them. And I still get royalty checks on that book for 40% of the total because I wrote the whole thing with the artist because I think highly of him, but the publisher was a piece of garbage. So be careful of that too. But when Joe and I got to the point where we had this book about two thirds of the way done, we were sitting there going, who else can we, who like, and then he went, well, you know, there was this guy named Bongo Bob from San Francisco that played percussion. Well, I hunted down Bongo Bob. He would give me these assignments and almost something to prove. And then Mick would come in. Once we sold the book, we had to do these methodical multi. But when that book came out, he wrote me a page and a half. Thank you. Well, not thank you, but acknowledgement. In the front of the book, credited me with coming to him with the idea. I've never had someone give me that. I, I always get a thank you, but never. It's maybe a sentence or two. This was, and then when he went out and did his press tour, because we released it with Sony, with a, a box set so you could listen to these song, albums and read how they were made. Hollywood Reporter, USA Today, Rolling Stone. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not variety. Places I would never myself have expected to be. Yeah, yeah. and this guy yeah. would go on, they'd ask three, four questions. And he, so he was such a nice guy. So the other thing is to pick people. If you're gonna spend two years writing a book with somebody, make sure that you either have a really temperament wise bedside manner that's very patient. Mm -hmm. And I've had that too, or that you're gonna just really like get along with them. But don't mistake yourself for their friend. And I think that's really important because I've, I've, I've across country rap, rock, alternative, I've, I've had the privilege of writing with pretty much every genre. And in country, I write with all of the top songwriters in town here in my series. And, and I don't go, though, hey, let's get that coffee sometime. Mm -hmm. And I'm as well known, I don't mean this the wrong way, but in Nashville, fortunately, in a country, my name has as known a value as theirs in any press setting. So it's not as though I'm going, hey, I'm a nobody, let, but I, I just know sure. better. So I'm, at a professional level. You're yeah, and, and that's the yeah. part that I'm least comfortable with, but you have to learn to be able to be comfortable getting in front of a camera and promoting your work. But the other thing is to let the star be the star. And that's the difference that I, I've known a, guy, a lot of guys over the years and ladies that were writing in this genre and there's not a lot of us there's a small club that keep doing it a long time and it's really because we know that their name is the big name and our name is the small name and when you write the book you remember that relationship and that they could pick anyone mm -hmm. to be in a room with joel selvin i just talked to for the show we'll get to in a sec he's they did uh, Hag hagar's book and at the same time sammy hagar i interviewed him for for satriani's book i asked him i said hey you know your author is really a cool, legendary music journalist from the Bay Area. 
And I said, I'm just curious when you guys got together, how that worked. He said, well, I loved reading his stuff. And I called him and said, do you want to book? And we ironically now share the same agent, uh, me and Joel. So it was funny when we talked because, but when you get to that point where you get, and you don't get them every year, you have to go out and look for them too. And you have to have multiple series. So all that led up to basically the, the National Songwriter Book Series took off after that. Satriani did well. Then I got to work with Merle Haggard and Freddie Powers and Willie Nelson on Spree of 83, Life and Times of Freddie Powers, which is out now, actually. Uh, it has a book soundtrack as well. And it's a 52-disc thing. And it has a all kinds of stuff. There's a movie coming up. We just finished the screenplay for last year. But to Wonderful. get all of those places, you have to like remember you're the small fry in the room. And, and I think that's so important because when an author sees their name, if they I never had a dream to be an author, but I talked to a lot of people who did and they see that first book, their ego gets so big that it almost outshines the artist that they're trying to work with, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and that's, and I'm just saying that because it, it, it can happen really easily without you realizing it because yeah. someone's really cool that you've always thought's really cool starts making you feel really cool. <laughs> yeah, somehow. Yeah. 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 Like Cut it off immediately. I love that. Because, and so anyway, all of that led up to getting to a place where I had hit 50 books and I was exhausted and I have early onset arthritis in my fingers, rheumatoid from my dad. And so then you have to start thinking about things like hiring a transcriptionist. Well, that's 20 bucks extra an hour that I'm putting in my pocket. And I write for a living. I pay a mortgage. I mean, I have a car payment. It's not a romantic job. It, it, people romanticize writing. It's a business. But I thought at that point with the Zoom thing that happened, and here I'm talking to you, I was talking to WGN Chicago's morning show and this morning show and that one. And I was like, not, not like today's show, but just these markets that I'm like, hey, cool, I'll talk to, uh, you know, yes, a million people in Austin, you know, that watch this TV channel. And I was like, we're doing all this from home. Everyone was having that realization, but I'd always wanted to do a show because I would go to the BEA, I, you know, you do your book promotions, your signings, and then you have this thousand dollar pass your publishers paid for, for you to walk the floor and not only pitch editors, your stuff, but also meet other authors. And I thought, man, there's not been, there's been all these pot, not like yours, that's really cool. But let's be honest. I mean, the podcast generation that started about 10 years ago, it's not peaked, but those that are still doing it are doing it because they know like yourself what you're mm -hmm. doing. But it's really something that can be done in theory, you know, but I, I could never have executed this concept because I had done TV things over the years too, but I'm very picky about them because I didn't want to be like the R. Kelly sensation thing where they want mm -hmm. you to salaciously yes. talk about him and all this stuff. And so- I thought, man, I've always wanted to interview authors, but the big obstacles have been hiring the independent stringer camera crew and then having to fly to the location, having to beg them to let me come into their house or meet them at some place I have to pay. Right. To There's a me. lot of logistics there. Logistical nightmares. Yeah. You go to the BEAs and do it, you get 10 minutes. And I wanted yeah. to do a fundamental, like take the template from the books where in the anthologies like National Songwriter, we break down not only the stories behind the songs, but we break down for half the chapter, the entire backstory. And there's stuff that comes out in those interviews that relates directly to the later writing of hits. But because, and, and most of them agreed to do it with me or like beyond the beats, the rock drummers. I have 43 drummers between books two and three from Topper Heaton and The Clash to Stuart Copeland to drummer to Dino Dinelli and every, you can name them, they're in there. And and I, I probably was a hundred drummers between that series. I said, why are you, you know, Alan White right. getting ready to do Imagine. Well, yeah, so anyway. As we turn the page to this, Jake, just uh, let me set this up a little bit. Right. But our guest is Jake Brown. He's a music biographer, but he's got a new project working now. He's putting together a streaming TV project called About the Authors TV, where he's sure. taken his experience in interviewing some of these musicians and artists and now applying that to interview authors about their creative process, about their techniques and their approach. Yeah. So to apply that concept to book, off, I'll tell you how that, how that happened and then how it took off. So I signed with a new agency last summer and I got tired of selling my own books. And, and at this, I'm, I'm, I'm in my mid forties. So I was like, I got to kind of think retirement time, which not from his, this, but having an agent who's going to take the 20%, but get me, you know, some bigger deals and go down the road. But I thought I also want to do a streaming television show. Cause I shot this thing for hearts breaking the band documentary in this little tiny studio on Berry Hill. And I was like, these people are all wearing masks and welder masks. And I was like, this is insane. I wouldn't do this if you paid me. But if I just get to this, the London, the producers were going with me over Zoom. And I was like, it doesn't look like crap anymore because Skype looked terrible. You couldn't use Skype for it. And because people got indoctrinated to the Zoom culture through these TV- Yeah, much more uh, accustomed to it. Yeah. They're, they're accustomed to it. And most of these authors sitting at home have 4K GoPros sitting there. What if I reach out to just a few of the best-selling authors in the world, not local, not regional. I only wanted to Aim, and that's the thing. Aim high. Don't aim middle. Aim high because you may end up two thirds of the way up, but that's a step up. I thought Sumon Kid, 
you know, Scott Turow, Lawrence Block, a few legends. And I was like, let me just reach out to them. And they'll tell me no, and I'll, I'll know the, and it's just this list is an older, Catherine Coulter, Heather Graham, Sue Monk Kidd, uh, Karen Slaughter, we just did last week. These are all from season one. God, Brad Meltzer, Neil Strauss, Steve Alton, who did the Meg movie, John Douglas, who's the Mindhunter profiler. <laughs> I mean, F. Lee Bailey, who was one of the first people I reached out to, wrote two of the best-selling defense books of all time. He died. We had his last televised interview. So it just kept taking off. Bernard Cornwell, I could go down this list. T.C. Boyle, I mean, legendary names. Martin Dugorda co-writes the, the Bill O'Reilly killing books. And I don't want to talk to Bill, but I want to talk to Martin. So anyway, all these people were amazingly generous with their time. And because I came in saying, look, I'm an author of 50 published books. I would be hosting the show. And I have a set that I shoot against. It's like uh, got bookshelves and it's a whole pro thing. We have just, we went to Amazon and to Hulu. See, a lot of people think that everything is directly done through Amazon. It's not. Most of it's independently produced through content providers that then go to distributors. And then that's what you wind up. And it might stream for two weeks and then you have to buy it. My rationale was if you're a Sumont kid fan of Light, Secret Life of Beasts, mm -hmm. you're going to see it for the week. You're going to pay the $2.99 to download to the keep episode. going. Yeah. And here, well, here you, for the first two seasons come out in December, you get 52 episodes. If you were to buy the whole thing, it'd be 40 bucks. You, but you can stream it as well. And it's going to be out in Britain. There's going to be a, about the Authors TV Britain edition. It's just going to go on and on. I've shot 10 seasons, well, eight seasons of the 10 we're going to be. And if I went into the names coming up, it would just, and we just got Ian Rankin. I mean, these are, these are like, I think we have 34 Pulitzer Prize winners. It does, I'm not, I only drop those sort of statistics so you understand the echelon of it. Cause I aimed like I did with the music business, but I applied it. So yeah, it's going to be. Well, I think this adventure. is the encouragement. And so again, somebody wants to hear that list and say, ah, name dropping. That's not the point. You're saying aim high. And that these oh, are the actual authors yes. that I substantiate exactly. that claim with. And, and, and then no one had about the author's TV. Like no one had National Songwriter. I was like, are you stupid somebody out there? Because <laughs> it's dumb luck. So that's what I mean. Like in the studio, dumb luck. Behind the boards, dumb luck. And then I just happened to, to spend the money on the lawyer and trademark it. Another cheap thing you can do, I come up with ideas sometimes. I don't know if they're going to work, but you get a certain proprietary protection with .com. Buy the .com. It costs you 10 bucks. So if you're if you're an, an author and you want to write in, in today's world, you have to be very entrepreneurial. You have to be able to be willing to spend money on a publicist, which is an extra five to seven, $8,000 that that's going to hurt. You're going to eat it, but you're going to get great press out of it because I joke like a public, they're wonderful and I deal with a lot of them, but average publishers, publicist is like a caseworker. They got about 30 cases on their desk and they can only give so many record labels. Same thing. They got 30 records. They got it. So if you're willing to put the money and invest in yourself, that's the other thing, man. Like when I get book advances, if I'm not paying bills, I'm putting it all right back in mm -hmm. because it's the only way that you build out a catalog. And then you get royalty checks off that catalog for years and years and years because you've got 20 and I've got, and I've also been published in 11 countries, quite fortunately. So I'm able to get J J Japan has been one of my main, I mean, we just, I just got hired to do a Michael Jackson book in the studio, Michael Jackson in the studio book there. They just took, God, they just bought a bunch of stuff. Mr. Kehoe at the English agency, go, go Mr. Hattori. <laughs> but the point is, man, it, if you're going to do new things, if you're going to sustain a career, process is important. You get those tools down, but you have to think about promotion, networking. You have to think about who's going to be reading your book, what they're going to be interested in, if they're going to be interested past the first few pages. Put stuff later. Don't give them everything at once. You can open talking about a big hit and then flash back to childhood, and then they're going to have to wait 200 pages to get to, to get back. Out. Well, <laughs> yeah, because, because you want to hold their interest that whole time. So hopefully the show will inspire aspiring authors. It also appeals to the fans. We talk about every book in depth, the creation of characters, the creation of storylines, series, but it's really designed to appeal to these kids who are not in a classroom right now or a lecture hall getting hearing from these people. And the fact that I was so honored that the list just continues to grow. The threshold is you have to be a bestseller, not of a Amazon list, but a New York Times. Or you, we wanted to keep a threshold there and, and have a few books out. But um, yeah, it's it's just, it, yeah, it's keep the really given me a new leg to my career that I'm grateful to have. And you have to reinvent yourself if you want to stay relevant. That's the other really hardcore piece of advice I'd hammer home. They don't all work. I've had a lot of things that I, I wrote off money on, but it's a new universe. I'm excited about it. Streaming is a great way for me to reach a lot more people that want to learn about how to write books and how the best that did it. You see, the other point is like, you're the host and I'm doing this, but it's about the people we're talking to. Uh, absolutely. And that's, what, that's what's so fun. And, and that's listener. what is so fun. Exactly. <laughs> Listeners, you have just had that full sense around experience we've been talking about. You've been listening to Jake Brown, author, music biographer, host of a new series called About Dream the Authors. TV. He writes, he writes about writing. He's an author. He talks to authors. It all comes around. Please go to aboutTheAuthorsTV.com. You can go to our YouTube channel. You can check out the spree of 83 book.com for Freddie Powers' book, which also has Merle Haggard and Willie in it. A ton of country stars. The other thing I would, I would, I would say is I'm writing a book in my summer camp. 
and maybe one of the first summer camp books that we've ever turned into a memoir. It's called 40 Legends. It was uh, uh, 25 years was open. So keep yourself entertained if you're going to keep doing this, because otherwise you're going to go nuts. You just got to keep trying to keep yourself entertained and just hope someone wants to buy it. Yeah, this is all <laughs> publisher first and then a reader. All practical advice. <laughs> yeah, publishers got to buy it first and a reader buys it. Hopefully, that's yeah. right. Look, a hundred episodes ago, I promised you a podcast that wasn't going to talk philosophy. It wasn't going to talk about you know how to be creative and motivational and blah blah blah. Otherwise, you could buy that at the Hallmark store. This <laughs> is the podcast where we talk to people who do the job, and you've heard it all the way from how do you uh, make money to how do you write off when you lose money. Yeah, you've heard it all. All in between. You got to do the work. You got to hustle. You got to carpe diem when the opportunities come. And Jake has shared it all. So check out jakebrownbooks.com about the authors tv.com. Thank you, Mark, for your time. I appreciate it. This has been Unlocking Your World of Creativity, where we have continued our travels around the world. We've been stamping our creative passports from Stockholm and Copenhagen and Johannesburg to LA and now in the music city of Nashville to talk to creative practitioners, find out how they get inspired, learn how they organize their ideas, and finally gain the confidence and the connections to launch their work out into the world. So until next time, I'm Mark Stenson. See you then. Thanks again to our sponsor, Design Hill the world's number one creative marketplace for business and individuals where you can access high quality designs from professional designers and unique products created by independent artists. You can get 25% off of Design Hill's logo maker service. Just use the discount code WF25. The link is in the show notes. And remember the offer is valid through November 30th, 2021. Unlocking your world of creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media, creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and thepeaceroom.love.